Delighted to be working with Gary Becker, who we're going to have a little chat with today. He's going to be working with us on our longevity concierge service, Vanderbilt and Hennessy. And I'm so excited and happy about launching this for super, super refined information. Because let's face it, it's a minefield out there. Let's find out what Gary's top five tips are, which are the most important points for our longevity. Hey, so here we have Gary Becker, who is the headline speaker today at the Optimum Health Summit. We're going to ask him for his top five tips to stressed out sports professionals, to stressed out CEOs and mm -hmm. executives. If you could sum it up, because I know you're busy. I'll sum it up, yeah. Sum it up, five so top tips. Here's please. my five top tips. Number one, we, we have to start with the basics, yes. right? And by the basics, I mean all human beings need the same three things. We need 91 essential minerals, we need three essential fatty acids, and we need two, I mean, and we need eight essential amino acids. So okay. most of us are deficient in one of those three things. We go chasing the exotics, but we've, we've overlooked the basics. So mineral salts, um, amino acids, and omega-3 fatty acids, that's where you start. Okay. And then when you stack on top of that, most of us um, forego sleep for travel and, and meetings. So Guilty. sleep is the first thing that gets compromised. If, you're, if you really want to be a top performer, um, schedule all of your meetings and travel around sleep and exercise. Make Love the non-negotiable sleep and exercise, not travel and meetings, right? So Love don't it. take the early morning flights, don't take the early morning meetings, don't take the late, um, late night dinners. It will not change your schedule. It will not, your relationships will understand. And if they don't, you don't want a relationship with them anyway. True. Um, because when you start to compromise those things, then you actually start to compromise focus, concentration, um, and just your overall well-being. And nobody can sprint like that forever. And then my, my um, third, fourth, and fifth would be, um, no, number one, get data on your body. Yes. Um, stop supplementing for the sake of supplementing. Start supplementing for deficiency. You want to see magic happen in the human body? Give it the raw material it needs to do its job. And the only way to find that is to test. And there's two tests that you need to do. A blood test, 72 biomarkers that you want to look at in the blood. Hormone control, a blood sugar um, control called your glycemic profile and your nutrient deficiencies. And then I always recommend people do one test in their lifetime and that's a methylation test. It's a genetic methylation test. And the reason for that is once you have that information, you will never guess on what your body needs to supplement with. So the basics, sleep, get data, and supplement for deficiency. And that would be my... Okay, Gary, and for these tests that are so important, mm -hmm. obviously we work with a big global network. Where could we find out more about you and more about where to go for those tests? Okay, so we want you to get can, it right. Yeah, you can go to my Instagram. It's just my first and last name, yes. Gary Brecca, at okay. Gary Brecca, or to uh, theultimatehuman.com, and I'll direct you um, where to go, even if it's not a testing center I'm affiliated with. Okay, but we're going to be referring a lot of our clients to you as well. Yep, let's do we're it. We're forward <laughs> to working together. Such a pleasure. Thank you. Have a great, great to see you. Have a great one. Thank you. in the mortality space, uh, researching mortality for large life insurance companies. And what that meant was, if we got 10 years of medical records on you and 10 years of demographic data, we could tell the insurance company how long you had to live to the month. And I get a lot of slack for that, because people say, well, you can predict life expectancy to the month, you'd be Jesus, or you want to know about the prize, obviously I am not Jesus, I worship Jesus, but, um, or you want to know, amen, right? His only son, none of us would be here. But, you know, it is, it is actually some of the most accurate science in the world. You see that large life insurance companies, unbeknownst to most of us, have data that no other financial services enterprise has. It's, in fact, no other collegiate institution has, no government entity has, because they know the day, the date, the time, the location, and the cause of death for 370 million lives. And they can triangulate this back into the medical record. We know the trajectory of every chemical, every pharmaceutical, every synthetic that goes into the human body. And this, for the fortunate sake of all of us, is about to reach humanity for the first time in three centuries. You see, over the next five years, modern medicine will be circumvented by artificial intelligence and big data. And the message that is coming from the rooms of people like you will be the message that humanity hears. 
You know, in that industry that I was in, for 22 years, I was not allowed to have any contact with the patient or any contact with the treating physician. Even if I saw life-threatening drug interactions, I could not pick up the phone and contact that patient to warn them. And I remember very specifically the day that I resigned, I was actually threatened with criminal prosecution for the audacity to pick up the phone and call a woman who was about to have a thrombolytic reaction between two medications. And I decided that this wasn't just data, these weren't just spreadsheets, that these were human beings. And I wasn't gonna spend one more day of my life predicting death, I was gonna spend the balance of my lifetime teaching people how to live healthier, happier, longer, more fulfilling lives. So that's it. since being here at this event, from traveling the world, from seeing biohacking and bio-optimization and longevity events like this, I have one big ask of you. And that is this. Begin to edify your competitors. You see, when God designed the tide, he made it to raise all of the boats. And our message for the very, very first time is seeing light. And if we turn inward on each other instead of outward with our message to help humanity, then the forces that are against us will succeed in crushing the message of this industry. And the way that we combat that is we shed light on each other. Right? We edify our peers. I did four podcasts yesterday because four people's voice needed to be heard. I have no affiliate relationship with them. Three of them are direct competitors of mine, but they have a message that humanity needs to hear. Don't be better because somebody else is worse. Be better because you're good on your own. That's what I'm saying. Right? It breaks my heart when I walk around the floor and I listen to uh, you know, a competitor tell me why they're good because their competitor's not. When I hear that you tell me about your message and why your message needs to be heard by humanity, my position is that I am not here to monetize my message. I am here to edify and amplify yours. And if we all took that attitude, this industry would steamroll the chemicals and the synthetics and the poisons and the industry of disease and symptom maintenance and, maintenance and chronic disease management and we would really change the world. We have an opportunity to change the face of humanity and really make a good living doing it. So that's, that's just something that I mentioned that I really felt that, that needed to be heard. Um, and if you follow me, you know that I very often edify my competitors. People that are direct competitors of mine that I have no affiliate relationship with that are doing good things, that are doing good research, for the benefit of humanity, they deserve a voice, and the people in this room all deserve a voice. So, um, this is one of the old uh, predictions that I did. You know, some of the, the uh, life expectancies that we did, you know, to this day, some of these are continuing to, to, to mature. We never use the term death, I said mature. But, uh, you know, people, people are maturing. It sounds so much better, doesn't it? But, you know, what is astounding is that, you know, if you've seen me speak before, you know that if I was to boy, my entire 22-year career in the mortality space, down to a single sentence, it would be this. And this will be the most impactful sentence that you hear for the balance of your lifetime in terms of how many more months you have left on Earth, your waking energy, the depth of your delta wave of sleep, your response to exercise, your libido, your mood, your focus, your concentration. And that is this. It is that the presence of oxygen is the absence of disease. The presence of oxygen is the absence of disease, and I'm going to explain that in more detail. But in 22 years, we did not find a single disease theological pathway, not one, that did not have its roots in the absence of blood oxygen, leading to the absence of oxygen in the mitochondria, leading to mitochondrial dysfunction, which eventually is the genesis of aging. Right, so when we start to simplify things, we are trying to get the mitochondria to better utilize oxygen, then we start to realize what can help us extend life and what helps us to shorten life. And so this is one of the original predictions that I did, but I say that every chance that I get, the presence of oxygen is the absence of disease. And the second thing that I say is that the reason why we discovered in 22 years why most people are not living longer, healthier, happier, more fulfilling lives was because of what we call modifiable risk factors. 
Modifiable risk factors were things that you can change in your daily life that will dramatically extend your life expectancy. In fact, I used to make a bold promise from the stage, I'll make it from the stage today, that if you do what I ask you to do today, you will add on average seven years, not just to your lifespan, but to your health span. You see, there are these little choices that we make in missing the basics that are causing us to not live longer, healthier, happier lives. And I'm going to touch on, on some of those today. I do not believe that we are as diseased or pathological as we are led to believe. I believe that human beings are nutrient deficient. And I, I do a thing from the stage, and I'll do it today if we have an extra few minutes. I will take any ailment that you or a loved one suffers from, any ailment, autoimmune disease, ADD, ADHD, OCD, manic depression, bipolar, all of those mental health issues, chronic conditions like Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis or what have you. And I will tell you right here from this stage in front of this audience what raw material is missing from that person's body that is causing the expression of that condition. You see, because we've been lied to. In my entire career, we used to talk about genetically inherited disease and how disease is passed from one generation to another. In the United States, 85% of all the diagnosis of hypertension is what we call idiopathic, right? It's of unknown origin. So 85% of the time you go to the doctor, we get diagnosed with high blood pressure. They have no idea what's causing it. You have a normal EKG, you have a normal EEG, you have a normal heart and lung sounds, you have a normal eye contrast study. They can't find anything wrong with the heart. So guess what we do? Medicate the heart. Hold it responsible for a crime that's not committed. And then what we do is we ask you a few questions. We go, well, you have high blood pressure. Um, and your grandfather on your mom's side had high blood pressure, and your father has high blood pressure, and his uncle, his brother, also has high blood pressure. So now guess what? It's genetically inherited. It's familial. Next time a physician says that to you, I want you to look him right in the eye and say, what gene did I inherit from my ancestor that caused this condition? Watch your face. <laughs> right? We knew that there, because things run in families, we call that a genetically inherited disease. But you tell me, anybody, raise your hand, what is the gene for hypertension? What is the gene for hypothyroid? What is the gene for type 2 diabetes? There are some conditions that predispose us to disease. The BRCA gene is a very real predisposition. But we do not pass disease from generation to generation, nor do we catch disease or pathology. These are not things that happen to us. They are things that happen within us. You see, we believe this in plant physiology. If you ever had a leaf rotting in a palm tree and you called a true artist, a true botanist out to your house, they wouldn't touch the leaf, right? They would pour test the soil. And they would say, you know what? There's no nitrogen in this soil. And they would add nitrogen to the soil and the leaf would heal. But we have stopped thinking about human beings this way. We have lost all faith in humanity and mankind and the ability of this to heal this. We know that when this surrenders, so do 32 trillion cells in our body. Remember, we are nutrient deficient. We are not as diseased or pathological as we think we are. And there is a course that I've been teaching to physicians and practitioners and, and thought leaders all over the world, and I say, whenever you approach a condition that a human being has, I want you to take these three vantage points. We're going to get into the weeds here in a moment. I want you to think of three things. As soon as somebody tells you the ailment that they're suffering from, and I don't care if it's an autoimmune disease or whatever it is, the first thing I want you to think in your mind is God did not make a mistake. Do not assume that this person woke up one day and they have Crohn's disease, so their, their immune system decided to attack the colon. They woke up one day and had Hashimoto, the immune system decided to manufacture antibodies to the thyroid. That the immune system made a mistake. Assume that it's acting properly, you just need to figure out why it's there. Right? Did they wake up one day and the immune system just go haywire and now it's attacking the colon? Or did they wake up one day and there were bacteria in the location that they shouldn't be and the immune system was called there for a reason and it is there doing its job and you are trying to stop it? Like a bouncer trying to keep people from entering a bar, right? He's going to say, listen, you're not allowed to go in there. If you go in there, I'm going to throw you out. And a fight's going to ensue, there's going to be a lot of inflammation and a lot of tissue damage and everything else, but I'm only here to throw you out. I am not there to cause all the rest of that damage. So number one, God didn't make a mistake. If physicians would approach the human body this way and first assume that it's acting properly, you would eliminate the first 75% of misdiagnosis because the third leading cause of death in this world is medical error. Yes, 2016 Harvard University, 2019 Johns Hopkins, both studies. One was worse than the other. They published a Harvard study because the Hopkins study got worse. Medical error is the third leading cause of death. This means that modern medicine kills um, more people than more obesity and diabetes come up. Only cancer and cardiovascular disease kill more people than modern medicine. 
right? If we applied that statistic to any other industry, it would be laughable. Right? If you, I don't know, if you sold uh, home security systems, you're like, but I'm the third leading cause of home invasion. <laughs> you guys want to buy my acne off the security system? Yes or no? Right? But we apply that to medicine, and that's where we go to see them. We have an opportunity, which is why I implore you to identify your competitors. We have an opportunity to change that, and we will only be handed this opportunity once. The pandemic passed this gift to people like us in this room, and we have a responsibility to treat that gift the way that God intended it to be, and to edify our competitors, and to allow this time to raise all of the votes, because humanity is behind us right now. So my point is that number one, God didn't make a mistake, and number two, and we're going to prove this in a moment, the second thing we should ask ourselves is what nutrient could be missing from this person's body to cause the expression of that disease? You see, what happens in human beings is when you deprive the human body of certain raw materials, like the nitrogen in the soil of the plant, you get the expression of disease. If I deleted your gut of tryptophan, you couldn't convert that to serotonin. It wouldn't travel up the vagus nerve and help to create mood and emotion. You would be diagnosed with mood disorder. Right? If I allow bacteria to leave through the wall of the gut and enter the luminal wall of the gut and the immune system went there and started to fight and have Crohn's disease, if you couldn't metabolize high homocysteine in your blood, which is in the blood of every single person in here, it's a natural amino acid, and it rose too high in your blood, your vascular system would contract and your blood pressure would rise and now you have hypertension. And this, and I could go on and on and on. And so we need to look for the nutrient deficiency in our bodies. And I'm going to tell you exactly how to do that. The first thing that we need to do is give the human body the raw material that it needs to do its job and to get out of its way. And the last thing is, we should always ask ourselves, what is the commonality? What is the common link between everything that this person has going on? And where do they all meet? You know, these, these cases, like, where people are like, oh my gosh, it was, you know, it, it was a miracle what you did with Dana White here. It was a miracle what you did with Steve Harvey. It was a miracle what you did with that woman that that chronic autoimmune disease. No, it wasn't. The miracle is that she was there. But what, what all I did was simplify the message. You know, there's a, the infamous uh, case where you know, Dana White's mother-in-law, which is very big in public domain, um, went to an emergency room with high blood pressure. She went to a private ER, and she was diagnosed with early onset dementia, congestive heart failure, and peripheral neuropathy. She came home to see Dan, and Dan called me, and he was like, how could this have all happened at one time? How did she lose her memory, her heart start to fail, and her nerves go haywire all of a sudden? And they sent her home with 13 medications. And I asked myself, in my mind, I said, you know what, what's the common link between all of those things? Mood disorder, ejection fraction in the heart, and peripheral neuropathy, it's all circulation. You deprive circulation to the brain, you lose short-term recall. That's the first thing to go. You reduce the circulation to the heart. That's the definition of lower ejection fraction, which is one of the symptoms of congestive heart failure. You reduce circulation to the periphery. You actually get neuropathic symptoms, but there's nothing wrong with your nerves. If I could give, I could give every single one of you peripheral neuropathy right now just by putting a tourniquet on your path. In 20 minutes, you'd have peripheral neuropathy in that foot. It would tingle, it would go numb, it would burn, it would itch, and eventually, in about an hour, I could pinch the top of your foot with all of my strength and you wouldn't feel it, and there is nothing wrong with the nerves of your foot. So I'm just trying to rewire the way that we think. These are not miracles. This is going back to having faith in the human body, searching first not assuming that we had made a mistake. Searching second for the missing nutrient in the human body, and third, trying to find the common link between everything that is going wrong in their body. It is astounding to me how many clients will come see me, and they will tell me that they are suffering from very severe anxiety. And as soon as they tell me they have anxiety, they go, I bet you also have severe digestive issues, gas, bloating, diarrhea, constipation, irritability, cramping. Oh my gosh, yes, I've had it all my life. You know, I know, also have the anxiety going on. And I bet you can't point to the specific trigger that causes that anxiety. They go, oh my gosh, no. It just sort of seemingly comes and goes without a trigger. And I bet anti-anxiety medications didn't work, they just made you feel like a zombie. Yeah, it really made you feel like a zombie. And you've had this since you were a little kid, you just didn't know how to explain the sensation of anxiety when you were a little kid. Yes, I have. And I bet when you lay down and go to sleep at night, as your environment quiets, your mind wakes up, 
And you find yourself just clicking through the day. The most innocuous little thoughts, right? You just lay there and you're like, eh, did I get everything on my grocery list? Did my phone match my shoes? Did I return that email? Like, how did you know all this? Because you only have one issue. You don't have nine problems, you got one. Right? Very likely are deficient in one of the most key nutrients in the human body called methylfolate. Because methylfolate is involved in the creation of the neurotransmitter serotonin when we flip tryptophan into serotonin. And then it is also involved in the peristaltic activity of the gut, the motility of the gut. This is the most overlooked thing in all of modern medicine because as soon as something goes wrong with the gut, we look to what we last ate. And we say, oh, well, I must have a food allergy. I must have a food sensitivity. We don't think about the intestinal tract as a 30-foot-long conveyor belt that is running at a certain speed. And if I change that speed, I screw up the entire conveyor belt. It has nothing to do with what I just ate. And so these people are chasing food allergies and food sensitivities all of their life when it's a motility issue. And then when they have a motility issue like that, they can't downregulate catecholamines. Catecholamines are fire, flight, and neurotransmitters. So what happens is when they lay down and go to sleep at night, their mind wakes up. So all of these spokes of the wheel come back to one common column. Right? That's the way we should be approaching pathology and disease dysfunction and, and not thinking that you have all of these separate conditions. Oh my gosh, you need to go see a GI for your gut. You need to go see a therapist for your mind. You need to see a cardiologist for your heart. You need to see a psychotherapist for the anxiety. And the next thing you know, you have four or five people involved and nobody's talking and we have them to the root cause of this. But right now, we are about to live the next five years through the most magnificent time in all of modern medicine. You see three centuries 300 years of medical advancement will be doubled in the next five years. You have the intersection of artificial intelligence, big data, and early detection. Right? And these are actually needed. We are not getting to cancers stage one. We are getting to cancers pre-stage one as the early metabolic shift starts to happen in our cells. Do you know that nobody in this room that knows somebody or has ever suffered from cancer caught cancer? What happened was a metabolically healthy cell shifted its metabolic state to becoming metabolically sick. And the immune system missed that shift and let that cell go, right? And then it manifested as cancer. But if we could sharpen that immune system, we could stop that transition. And what you're about to see is big data is going to circumvent the system. No longer will we be able to point at peer-reviewed, published, randomized clinical trials that take a single cell out of a human being and drop it in a petri dish and look how it behaves in a petri dish in a lab and then extrapolate that out to society. We're not going to be able to say, well, LDL cholesterol up, take a step, push LDL cholesterol down, and down those cardiovascular disease. Because the data is going to say, well, when you push that down, all of these other things happen, right? We interrupt cell walls and cell membranes and hormones and polycalciferol, and we bought all these downstream consequences. So guess what? We're not going to do that anymore. Because the data says otherwise. I'm telling you, you guys are on the ground floor of the most magnificent shift in all of humanity. And if we don't lose this war internally, we will win this war externally. I promise you that. Right? I promise you. Thank you. I got a little word over there. Oh, yeah. Okay. Right. So, uh, so I made my bold promise. Um, that's actually my daughter doing a gene test. This is, again, talk about identifying my competitors. I, I, I want you guys to see something. I'm going to ask a very specific question, and I really only want you to raise your hand if you fit exactly the terms that I'm going to say. If you have had a life-changing experience with me, or with information that I have given to you, or you have gotten from me through social media or stage talk or any other channel, but you have never paid me a penny, <coughs> You have had a life-changing experience with some of the information I've given you. Can you just raise your hand? I want you guys to look around the room. That's why you need to notify your competitors. Right? It's not to monetize your message. It's to elevate all of our messages. Right? And if we, if, if we all had that attitude, every single hand in the room would have just gone. So one of the things that I am an enormous proponent of is data. Right? Because how do we find out what raw material is missing in the human body? We actually ask the human body for that information. You know that right now, you can put all 32 trillion cells in your body into a conference room. And they can have a meeting about you. And they will write a book to you, and they will tell you exactly what they need to repair, to detoxify, to eliminate waste, to regenerate. They will tell you specifically what nutrients you need. That book 
is called a methylation test. And that methylation test, you do not have to do this through me. I can even offer it in the UK. So I'm not here to get you to do my methylation test. If you want to wait until I'm offering in the UK, I will I'll put you on a list at the end of my presentation. But there are places in the United Kingdom right now that do these methylation tests. And when you do these, you swap the inside of your cheek. For the first time, you get to see what your body is deficient in. Not what you think you should be supplementing with. You see, most of us are supplementing for the sake of supplementing. We are not supplementing for deficiency. You want to see magic happen in human beings? Give their body the raw material it needs to do its job. Right? This is when magic happens in human beings. You, you're seeing towards the tail end of this year, some of you guys know about this project, the first wave of superhuman athletes that I have in the UFC and the NFL and some other sports. Some of it's kind of leaked out a little bit. But these are not superhuman athletes. These are athletes that have found the superhuman in them by giving their body the raw material it needs to do its job. So many of you right now and loved ones that you have are suffering from ailments because they are nutrient deficient. Right? I tell all everybody the same thing. If you want to know where do you start, where does somebody when they come to you and say, where do I start my health journey? You start it here with three things. Okay? All human beings need the same three things. We need 91 essential minerals. Nearly every single one of us is deficient in one of those. You need two essential fatty acids, omega-3 fatty acids, and you need eight essential amino acids. If you are missing one of those three simple things, chasing all of the exotics in the world is not going to help you. But like therapy will not help you, the brain tap won't help you, the neurotropics won't help you, NAD, NMN, nicotinamide, riboside, nicotinic acid, none of that will help you because your body needs certain basic raw materials. 91 essential minerals, two essential fatty acids, eight essential amino acids. That's where you start. The second thing you do is you get data. Right? You get data. Or else you get lost in the myriad, the soup of everything that is possible. People ask me all the time, what do you think about this supplement or that supplement? I go, it's great. The question you should be asking me is, what does your body need? Right? The biggest fallacy in all of modern medicine is that what goes into her body, it goes into his body, it goes into my body, it goes into hers, is treated exactly the same way. Nothing could be further from the truth. We know now from artificial intelligence and big data that there are 700 trillion possible genetic combinations from the 50 methylation genes. 50 genes lead to 700 trillion potential combinations. You are not going to figure that out. The human body will figure it out if you give it the raw material it needs to do its job. So you start first with those three categories, you go second to data. And I believe if you're going to get data, you should do a blood test, you should do a genetic test. The genetic test should specifically look at the genes of methylation. How does my body take in one raw material and convert it into a usable form? I always use the analogy that we pull crude oil out of the ground, right? But you can't put crude oil into your gas tank, right? Because crude oil needs to be converted to gasoline for the car to understand that fuel source. You see, but we, we in, in human beings, this process is called methylation. Right, 300 billion times every single day. Here's what it looks like. I've memorized that whole entire chart. Um, I actually have. Um, yeah, there's going to be a quiz on this later. Take a take a snapshot of your mind. Take a sketch. There's the NPHFR motherfucker right there. All right, All right. But that's only one part of a giant soup. Um, and you will see that this this process, your body has figured out. Right. Don't go in and try to figure it out. Just give it the raw material that it needs to do its job. Right? Like sometimes when I, when I walked around this floor, they said, what was your favorite modalities you, 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 you saw on the floor today? I said, the ones that are mimicking what God put into nature. Magnetism, oxygen, light. Right? Grounding, breath work, sunlight, the basics, clean water. So, so this is the, these are the methylation pathways. But if, you, if I was to narrow these down, you can look at five genes. You can supplement for those five genes, and all of this will take care of itself. But if you look at the offshoots of all of the mental conditions and the mental disorders, we, we don't have a mental health crisis in this world. We have a lack of mental fitness. Right? And you know what's happening now that you're seeing, if you actually pay attention to what's happening in modern medicine and all of these peer-reviewed published clinical studies and all this cycle of randomized clinical trials, you are actually finding that big data is blowing through those, right? 10 years ago, when we, 15 years ago, when we formed the serotonin hypothesis of depression, right? If you go to the PDR right now, it will say, by the way, how, how many of you have ever suffered from or know somebody who suffered from depression? 
like that. It's almost half of the audience. And so the theory was, well, if you were low on the neurotransmitter serotonin, you were by definition depressed. Right? So if if being low on serotonin means you're being depressed, then wouldn't you think the fix would be to raise serotonin? But that's not what we do. Right? We take people that are depressed and we put them on SSRIs. We put them on selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. So what these do, in effect, is they actually rationally slow down the absorption of serotonin. So they ration the little serotonin you have. So by definition, they never raise serotonin. So by definition, they never end depression. That's why I had clients come in to see me after 15 or 18 years. I would ask them, how long have you been on these antidepressants? 18 years. I'm like, when did you think it was going to kick in? <laughs> Should we run this for another 24 months and you come back and see if sort of towards the tail end there, it kind of has an uptick? Right? It's because, in, but now we, we looked at the serotonin uh, and it was the full of randomized clinical trials, full of peer reviewed, double blind, placebo controlled trials, all the ones that said this narrow thing works for all of humanity. And now, guess what? Oh, now the increased rates of suicide, increased rates of depressive thoughts chronic um, depression, what they call crushing depression, irreversible tachyphylaxis, desensitization of the, of, the, of the transmitters. Same thing is happening to our cholesterol industry. The same thing is happening to our diabetes industry, right? We used to just isolate one little thing, the LDL cholesterol, we just pointed a spotlight on it and said, that's the worst thing to happen to human beings. As soon as LDL cholesterol goes up, then cholesterol, um, then cardiovascular disease skyrockets. You know what we do in the mortality space? Because we had data. We knew that we had seen hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of centenarians file death claims. And we didn't see a single centenarian that died with normal levels of LDL cholesterol. Without a single exception, they were all elevated upon their death. So you know what we did with those clinical trials? We threw them out and we followed the data. Right? And so let's not wait another 10, 15 years for the cycle to turn, right? The data is in front of us right now. We're the warriors that are going to take this message to the masses. Um, so these are the five genes that I suggest that you start with. Right? We're becoming more and more sophisticated. The reason why I put these genes up here is if you can find a place that does this test, this is where you will get the biggest bang for the buck because this will tell you exactly what raw material is missing from your body that is causing the expression, not just of disease, but of all of the little nagging things that most of us in this room are putting up with because we believe that they are the consequence of aging. You know, I mean, clients, and even I'm, I'm 53 years old, I mean, you know, guys my age, I talk to them, they're like, yeah, I'm just supposed to have a little bit of belly fat. You know, I'm not supposed to, I mean, I've lost my libido, I'm really not supposed to be that hard. Um, you know, I, I'm not supposed to have, I, you know, I'm just not as sharp as I was, my short-term recall, my focus, my waking energy is way up, I don't sleep that well, it's just a part of aging. It is not a consequence of aging. It is a consequence of missing raw material in your body. If you have this gene right here, it's actually called a motherfucker gene, right? <laughs> How many of you know that you're a motherfucker in this right now? 30% of you, welcome to the call. Every time somebody calls me one, I say, as a matter of fact, I am. I got it from both my parents. Uh, <laughs> So, it stands for methylene tetrahydrofolate reductase, right? So if you, by the way, if you are going to Google around about this gene, please capitalize it. You got lots of us who made that mistake. You find yourself on some super colorful websites. You know, you don't capitalize that. But, so, so, what does this gene do? The MTHFR gene, it converts folic acid into something called methylfolate. It doesn't sound like a big deal, right? Until you realize that folic acid is the most prevalent nutrient in human diet. So you also realize that folic acid is an entirely man-made chemical. Folic acid does not occur naturally in nature. You cannot find folic acid anywhere on the surface of the earth. You will never convince me that a synthetic chemical that we make in the laboratory that didn't even exist until 1983 is somehow the most integral part to a healthy pregnancy. What's the most integral part to a healthy pregnancy is methylfolate. That's what prevents neural tube defects. That's what keeps women from having postpartum depression, which actually develops during um, during the pregnancy period. But yet still, what happens when women get pregnant? We tell them to take high doses of folic acid, prescription strength folic acid. 44% of the world's population has that gene mutation, which means half of the room has this gene mutation. If you have that gene mutation, you can't process folic acid. If you're an unfortunate female that gets pregnant and you have that gene mutation, and your doctor tells you to take 1,800% of the daily allowance of folic acid, you will develop postpartum depression. 
Eventually, what will happen is the pregnancy will end, you'll stop taking the prenatal vitamin, the symptoms will go away, and you will blame it on the pregnancy, not on the vitamin. Right? And so, what we need to do, again, we have to go back to the basics. Our body processes methyl folate. 44% of us do not process folic acid, so that's the first thing to get out of our diet. So, what happens when you have that gene mutation and you don't know it? What are some of the consequences of that? You have slow intestinal motility. And you're going to spend an entire lifetime chasing allergies. Like you, you, you thought you had a food sensitivity. You thought you had a food allergy. You didn't. You had a motility issue. Back to that, that narrative I was telling you about where the intestinal tract is a 30-foot long conveyor belt. You put contents on it at one end as they exit the stomach. And before they exit the rectum, where it grows very acidic. And it traverses the rectum. I mean, traverses the intestine and exits at the rectum in a very basic environment. If you change the speed of that conveyor belt, Everything goes haywire. You get gas, bloated, diarrhea, constipation, irritability, cramping, and you start chasing food allergy, food sensitivity, gut microbiome, bifidobacteria, lactobacillus, you know, my antibiotics, SIBO. You start chasing all of these things, and it's a 10 year journey for you to just figure out your body was simply missing methylfolate. And if you get enough methylfolate, you can restore the proper intestinal motility. And all of that will go back to normal. It is amazing how resilient we are when we just give the body the raw material that needs to do its job. As you move up this, this MTR and this MTRR, these are important for two reasons. One, because the leading cause of hypertension is not cardiovascular disease. It's actually not an issue with the heart. In fact, most people that have hypertension have perfectly normal cardiovascular workouts. How many of you have or know somebody who suffers from hypertension? Half of the room. Right? So I bet if you looked at your diagnosis, it's like the idiopathic. When you talk to your parents about it, it's like the idiopathic. They didn't inherit hypertension from their ancestor, and you did not inherit hypertension from your ancestor. Likely what you inherited was one of those two gene mutations. Because it's astounding the way the human body works. We actually take one raw material, we put it into a process, we use it in that process, and we spit out waste. Then we actually take that waste and we put that into another process, and it gets used in that process called methylation, and then that waste gets spit out, and so on and so on. The, the more I study the human body, the more I truly believe in God that this was an intelligent design. This definitely didn't happen by, by mistake, because when you see the intelligence of taking one raw material and using its waste product to actually fuel another cycle of the body, you realize how intelligent this system is. But when you deprive it of certain portions of that cycle, it goes haywire. And this is when the labels come in. And I want to avoid the labels of pathology and disease. I want to get back to nutrient deficiencies. I really want to restore faith back into you know, human beings and mankind. So if you have to look one of these two genes, what will happen is an amino acid in your blood will start to rise. It's called homocysteine. It's in the blood of every single person in this room. And as it rises and it's cruising by the inside lining of the artery, it begins to irritate the artery. And you know what happens to an artery when you irritate it? It squeezes down. You have 63,000 miles of blood vessel in your body. It does not take much arterial narrowing to drive pressure up. So now what happens is the arterial system constricts and the pressure goes up. And they do all these diagnostics on the heart, there's nothing wrong with the heart, but they medicate the heart anyway. Because they didn't actually think that a simple nutrient deficiency called trimethylglycine, TMG, could be causing your vascular system to contract. Do you know, by the way, that the heart can actually lose 70% of our circulatory system? How many of you actually think you have a heart strong enough to reach your toes every time it beats? Yeah, it's not, right? Your heart's not strong enough to pump blood to the tip of your finger, to the tip of your toes, or to even, even reach a tenth of the supply of blood that goes to your liver. None of your hearts are strong enough to pump blood through the vessels of your eyes. So how does 70% of our circulatory system work? Does anybody know? What it's called? Vasomotor microcirculation. Did you go watch my videos? <laughs> Shame on you. How dare you? This is my talk. Um, now I'm embarrassed. No. She's right. Vasomotor. Right? About, we're about 7.5% arteries, about 14% veins. The rest of your circulation, not done by the heart, it's done by what's called vasomotor activity, right? Like a snake swallowing a mouse. Right? That vasomotor activity 
is the most important part of your circulatory system. 70% of your blood circulates into the organs and the tissues that need that blood so highly because of vasomotor, not because of cardiovascular. And so if your vasomotor activity is constricted, what kind of consequences come from depriving the rods and the cones and the macula and the retina of circulation? Nearsightedness, farsightedness. Why do readers come in to play in our late 40s and early 50s? Because everybody's eyes start to fail in the late 40s and early 50s? No, because your vasomotor activity begins to decline and you get the expression of ocular disease. This is why people that lay in red light therapies often stop wearing readers. It didn't fix their eyes. It just restored natural circulation. You see, we've got to stop thinking of pathology and disease. And we need to go back to what makes human beings work the way that we were supposed to work. Our diets used to be full of trimethyl glycine, but now our soil is depleted, our water is poisoned, our air is polluted, so it is up to us to put those nutrients back into the human body. Astounding things happen to human beings when we give the body the raw material to do its job. I keep repeating that because I want you to go home listening to that in your head, right? And I want you to think, wow, could it be that my autoimmune disease that my lifelong struggle with gut motility issues, that my psychiatric illness that I've been diagnosed with is really just a nutrient deficiency. What do you have to lose if that's true? And so as you go up here, right, you get to AHCY and COMT, you start to compromise the things like AHCY is highly involved in the metabolism and the, the, the methylation process of something called dopamine. Well, dopamine happens to be the main driver of behavior. We used to say in the mortality space, the absence of dopamine is the presence of addiction. If you've ever met an addict, or actually know a true addict, one thing you will know about their behavior is that it has a tendency to shift. It never really has a tendency to go away. But if you've ever actually known a real addict, like a, 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 a true alcoholic who's conquered alcoholism and now smokes weed, or somebody that did drugs and now drinks, or somebody that used to drink and do drugs is now a workaholic or work alcoholic. What is happening? What's happening is they have impaired methylation of a neurotransmitter called dopamine, the main driver of behavior. And as you deplete this neurotransmitter, they begin to seek dopamine-seeking behavior. They don't have an addiction. They have an imbalance of dopamine. We've labeled them an addict. And it's not because they want to get banged up. It's because they are searching for normalcy. Right? You show me a child that can play video games 14, 15, 16 hours a day, I will show you a potential future addict. They have a tendency to play video games for that long period of time, not because they like the video game, but because the video game makes them feel normal. And this is what happens in those cycles of addiction. This is why I hate the label of addiction, because what happened to most addicts is they didn't just wake up one day and say, I want to get really banged up. They woke up one day and said, I want to feel normal. And in the search for normalcy, they developed an addiction. And now they're running from the love. They're not running towards God. We fix the dopamine, that's why I get so much of my time to addiction centers and treatment facilities, because if you fix the dopamine deficiency, you permanently put that affliction in the very end. Right? Nutrient deficiency. As you get towards the top, COMT, C-O-M-T, how many of you have actually heard of the Dutch hormone test? Like, if you, if you, that, just put your hands up nice and high, right? So, those practitioners um, and, and those of you that, 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 that deal with male and female hormones, I mean, one of my favorite tests for, for female hormone therapy is, is the Dutch test, because it's it's more accurate instead of taking the snapshot in time and looking at estrogen, testosterone, recognizing hormone, you know, follow the stimulating hormone in the cycle. You're actually taking several snapshots, and so you actually get to see the ratio of hormones. We know in women, by the way, they're, they're complicated. Um, but I have a whole other talk on women. It's four years long, right? Um, right? And that's just, just scratching the surface, right? Um, but we, we know in, we know in female hormone therapy, most of you that, that are in this business will probably agree to this, that the ratios are more important than the levels, right? We used to treat levels of hormones, now we treat ratios of hormones, right? If, even if you're in menopause, you still have a cycle of just the amplitude's low. So my point is that if you look at a Dutch test, there is that gene mutation that's on every Dutch test, COMT, catapult o methyl transferase. And the majority of the guys that I talk to that actually read Dutch test hormone interpretation don't know what that gene mutation does. So it's actually right there on the test, but they don't know. They're like, well, I don't know what that is, COMT, I'm just going to skip over. Right? But the truth is, COMT, catechol o methyl transferase, is what actually sends estrogen down one of the elimination pathways. It's called the E2 pathway. What it also does 
is it down-regulates catecholamines. So pay attention if you've known anyone that has suffered from depression or anxiety or anxiousness or ADD or ADHD or OCD. By the way, how many of you with all of those names know someone who is suffering from one of those conditions? Or have a, have a friend? You're raising your hand for a friend. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I'm asking. It's like all the other cognitive function issues. Yeah, a friend of mine. <laughs> Problem south of the border just talked to her right before I came in here. Had all the details, so I wanted to ask her. It's okay. It's fired up. So, so what happens when we cannot regulate catecholamines? By the way, does anyone know what catecholamines are? Anyone? Not you. Please don't do this. I'm not ready to have you do Catecholamines are fight or flight neurotransmitters. If you drove home tonight and you got out of your car and somebody was standing in front of you with a knife, you know what happened? Your brain would flood with catecholamines. Nor I know, ephedrine, norepinephrine, ephedrine, one of those we call adrenaline and dopamine. Right? And when those hit the brain, your pupils would dilate, your heart rate would increase, your extremities would flood with blood, you would begin to have a fight or flight response. Right? Because as those four neurotransmitters rise, those catecholamines rise, they solicit an, a feeling of fear. And you are responding to a threat. But you can also be laying in your bed tonight in London, and you can start thinking about getting eaten by a shark. And you could have the exact same reaction. How is it that you could have the exact same reaction to an entirely imagined fear as to the presence of a real fear? Because of catecholamines. Because at the at where they meet is exactly the same thing. If I could magically inject you with those four neurotransmitters, catecholamines, you would immediately begin to feel fear and you would begin to have a fear response. That is the definition of anxiety. You see, nobody tells you what anxiety is. When people suffer from anxiety, they are told it's the feeling of fear. It's, it's the sensation of the presence of fear without the presence of a fear. It's, it's, it's a feeling of being anxious. Um, it's, it's, it's a lack of situational awareness. It's generalized anxiety. But nobody says, what is it? What's going on in my body? What's going on is you're having a rise in catabolism. So, is it possible that if you have a gene mutation that has been depleted, that needs extra B vitamins, yes, just simple B vitamins, riboflavin, thiamine, niacin, panathenic acid, right? Simple B vitamins in a very specific form of B12 called hydroxy or demisol cobalamin. And sometimes um, something called SAMI, S-adenosylmethionine. Is it possible that if you are missing those simple nutrients and you had that gene mutation, that you would be prone to elevated catecholamines? Yes. And what does it mean when you have elevated catecholamines? It means that you feel fear without the presence of fear, which is the definition of anxiety. So now you have been diagnosed with a mental disorder that you do not have because you have a nutrient deficiency not allowing your body to regulate those ones. Not allowing them to regulate those fight or flight neurotransmitters. And what can happen when these continue to rise? First they arise, they have a waking state. So if you have a yellow calm tea, this is how you're sleeping. You lay down to go to sleep at night, and your body is tired, but your mind is awake. Um, and you look like you're alive. Yes, sir. <laughs> Amen. So I go to church. Hallelujah. Uh, so it, yes, I'm, I'm talking to you. So you lay down to go to sleep at night, but you are body tired, but you are mind awake. And I will tell you exactly what you were thinking about. You ready? The most innocuous nonsense. Right? It's nothing that couldn't wait until the next day. You start clicking through the day. You know, those, those of you that have a notepad on your nightstand so you can get thoughts out of your head at night, you have that gene mutation. Right? Right? And, you're like, and what is OCD? Obsessive and compulsive disorder. OCD is just not, nothing more than disorganization in the mind, craving organization in the outside environment. The more active your mind is, the more you crave organization in your outside environment. You guys that are need freaks, you're constantly overthinking everything, right? You need to sit down and work on a computer. The desk the computer's on needs to be clean, and the room the desk is in needs to be clean. Because if there's a sock against the baseboard, it's going to f*** up my whole ability to concentrate. And I'm specifically talking to my wife, right? Sometimes I will purposely plant shit like that just to see if she sees it. Not once ever has she walked by a shoe 
for Aristotle and counter common knowledge. Okay? So the point is that when catecholamines rise, we are hyper aware. When catecholamines rise, our brain is awake. When catecholamines rise too far, we begin to feel fear. If they continue to rise, it changes our heart rate. And if it changes our heart rate, it will actually make our periphery go numb. These are not mood disorders. These are not mental illnesses. These are not generalized anxiety, generalized depression. This is not obsessive compulsive disorder. This is a nutrient deficiency in a complex of B vitamins, generally led by two forms of B12 and sometimes a deficiency in saline. That's what it is. Right? But we have all of these exciting labels because if I can get you to subscribe to the fact that you have a disease, I can get you to subscribe to a lifetime of medication. Right? And that is an industry built on symptom management and disease maintenance. And that's what we have. And that's why I want to change it. So, um, okay, you guys with me?
After the age of 30, 95% of people will never sprint again. Um, I have a tendency to believe that that's actually true. But even whether it's 90 or 95% of the population means they're never going to sprint again. What that means is that we're not using our auxiliary muscles of respiration. And when we don't use muscles in the human body, they atrophy. One of the things that we realized in the mortality space was that um, people were um, not dying from disease and pathology early, they were dying from a lack of respiration. And we put them on a toxic curve, and we tried to predict how well or how poorly they were using oxygen in the human body. The more poorly you utilize oxygen, the faster you are accelerating all forms of disease and pathology, the faster you are accelerating towards the grave. The better you utilize oxygen, the longer, healthier, the happier your life will be. Do you know that every elevated emotional state, passion, elation, joy, arousal, libido, every elevated emotional state, if you look at the molecular structure of that emotion, it contains oxygen. Do you know if you look at depressive states, anger, vengeance, jealousy, despair, resentment, they don't contain oxygen. There you don't need oxygen to feel those emotions. That's why those emotional states are readily available to you. That's why no human being has ever woken up laughing. You don't have the oxidative state to experience laughter out of sleep. But can you wake up angry? Yes. Want to do a really cool experiment tonight? Just pinch your spouse for her and deep sleep. <laughs> you will instantly wake up angry. Go, there it was right, I told you, baby. Um, so, but the point is, this is why these emotional states are readily available to us. They don't require the oxidative state. If I want you to laugh, I have to orient you, raise your oxygen, then you can experience passion, elation, joy, arousal. The presence of oxygen is the absence of disease. The difference between anger and passion is one neurotransmitter and the presence of oxygen. Without the neurotransmitter, you can't have it, and without the oxygen, you also can't. Right? This is why sick, fat, tired people don't build empires. Really? So that's why I'm such an enormous fan of breath work, exercising those intercostals that we only use during sprints when we respire heavily. If we learn to, you know, to strengthen these muscles, it really, you know, it's one of those things you can do for free. You can entirely change the trajectory of your life. Um, okay, so I, I want to talk for a moment about the brain because the reason, you know, I, I, a lot of what I just finished working on was a lot of research for Mental Awareness Month. Um, last month I did a lot of interviews and stage talks on mental health. And what was astounding to me was the more I researched mental health, the more basic it became. And I, I certainly do not want to gloss over uh, trauma or to poo-poo therapy or to, to poo -poo counseling. By no means do I not um, say that people actually really do experience trauma and they actually in counseling and psychotherapy are very beneficial. What I am saying is that I would rather not learn to cope with something. I would rather have it be permanently in my rearview mirror. So if we actually want to put mental illness and some of these mental conditions permanently behind us, we don't focus on coping mechanisms. We focus on mechanisms that can get rid of the condition. Would you agree with that? Yeah. Okay, so when we talk about emotion, Right? Um, everybody that's in this room right now, you feel every emotional state that you have, you feel this in the center of the brain called the amygdala. You ever heard of the amygdala? It's like the size of two little, you guys are super old. Oh. Yeah, see, so, of course, the lady over there, she was right <laughs> She had um, So um, the amygdala is like two little eggnuts, right? Um, sitting in your brain. That's where you feel every emotional state. What is astounding is that MIT proved that the amygdala is the sole gateway to an area of the brain. It's actually not back there, 10 minutes, okay? Um, it's called the hippocampus. And the hippocampus is where your memory is stored. What's significant about this, and I can't emphasize this enough, is there is one pathway to the hippocampus. It is through the amygdala. Which means that your emotional state determines what memories you recall. If you've ever had a really good argument with your spouse, you, re you remember it every single time, and some women are especially good at this, every single time they made you feel that way, right? You did this on September 21st when we were at your, your buddy's house. You did this at your mother-in-law's house nine years ago on Thanksgiving. <laughs> what? Um, how did you remember that? You know, and you did it on April 14th, two days after our daughter's birthday when we were driving to this town. Like, how the because memory is directly linked. Motion is directly linked to memory. Our memory is what our prefrontal cortex and our consciousness pulls from. Right? And our consciousness is our future. 
Right? We consciously create our future. So what this means is that your current emotional state determines what memories you recall, and the memories you recall determine when your prefrontal cortex pulls, which determines your future, which means that your current emotional state determines your future. That is a scientific fact. So if you don't learn to master your emotional state, you will never control your future. Let's cut through all the noise that is out there. If you do not learn to master your emotional state, you will never control your future. If you want to control your future, learn to be in control of your emotion. What this means is, oops, what this means is there are certain amino acids, certain vitamins, and certain nutrients that form the neurotransmitters that modulate the amygdala's response to emotion, which means that nutrient deficiencies lead to emotional disturbance. Emotional disturbance leads to poor memory recall, which forces a future that we do not want to walk into. We are not controlling our future because we are nutrient deficient and our emotional state is out of balance. You see, I only need to make one center of the brain out of balance. I only need to deprive one part of the brain of certain nutrients to have the rest of the brain follow. It's like the head, you know, the tail follows the head, right? So if I actually deplete certain raw materials in the human body, leading to a neurotransmitter imbalance, poor methylation of serotonin, poor methylation of dopamine, which by the way occurs in the gut, 90% of the serotonin in your body is right here. If you don't have it here, you can't have it here. So what I'm saying is we are focused on mood, memory, emotion. We're, we're focused on, 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 on waking up in gratitude and journaling. And all of those things are great. But what I will tell you is they are coping mechanisms if you are nutrient deficient. Fixed in nutrient deficiency. And then those coping mechanisms, they, they, they may provide all of the support in the world. Waking up in gratitude, I think, is a great idea. Journaling is a great idea. Prayer is amazing. But when you try to reshape your future, when you are nutrient deficient, it is like dragging an anchor behind a boat and just adding power to the motor. So if we have the right amino acid balance, the right nutrient balance, the right vitamin balance, and we are not deficient, what will happen is in your gut, the methylation cycle that is making the neurotransmitters that are manifested in the amygdala will create an emotional state that allows you to draw on positive memories, which will project a positive future for you. So I'm just trying to tie all of this back in to say, guys, let's put the raw materials back into the human body and let it function the way that it was designed to function. When stuff starts going wrong up here, let's not get out into the outside world and look for a cluster of symptoms. Let's look inside to see what is missing that could be causing this condition to exist. Right? We would really serve humanity by doing that. So people ask me all the time, I know, I know I only have a few minutes, and then if you guys, if you, if you feel like I'm providing value, I would like to open it to questions. We'll, we'll run over the time, and I know that Tim is going to uh, is going to do the closing, but I did say it for over a minute or two. So I want to be respectful of your time, um, but I also want to give you guys a chance to, to, to ask me some questions. Uh, this is the most common question that I get asked, what's your morning routine? Welcome to take a picture of that. The majority of this will not cost you a damn thing. Right? Will not cost you anything. Grounded. It, it is. It is astounding. What you know? The best modalities that are out in that center, uh, you know, in that other room right there, are mimicking what we get from other nature. You take your shoes off and touch the surface of the earth, and come in contact with the magnetism of the earth. Earthing and grounding is a real thing. We discharge into the earth. We change the polarity in our body. First light, which is a very special type of light in the morning, no UVA, no UVB, only vitamin D3 rays. Yes, even if you're in cloudy London, you still get those. Breath work, cold water immersion, or um, hydration. I'm a huge believer in, in hydrogen water. You guys probably know that. Um, if, you, if, if you're not sold on hydrogen water yet, write this website down, hydrogenstudies.com. Go to hydrogenstudies.com, read any number of the 1,300 pyramid studies on hydrogen water, and you will immediately begin to drink that. Um, and then supplementation. Notice that I say for deficiency, not to say the supplement. Supplement first for deficiency. Um, and this is what I believe is the, is the foundation for all of us. Um, and then before I take some questions, I, I write a weekly newsletter. 
Um, it's, it's completely free. Um, you, can, you can sign up for it there. I also will keep you informed of, of when um, I'll be coming to the United Kingdom and when the tests that I offer will be available here. Until then, you know, I'm sure there are other great places that you can, you can have those done. Um, you guys feel like you've gotten value out of this today? <laughs> I, I, I think 